our major tasks was Lori and I, we met with the people in the Canadian government, Health Canada. They have their version of the Indian Health Service. It's called uh, the First Nations and Inuit Health Branch of Health Canada. And they had people in charge of suicide prevention, including a psychiatrist who worked full time there. So we met with them about suicide prevention. They knew that what they had done didn't work. They were, they were bringing Inuit from different communities in. They brought them south. They gave them this two week training program or white suicide prevention. They sent them back. As you can see, the suicide rates just kept climbing up. Nothing happened. I talked to some of the Inuit who had been to those workshops actually when I was up there and I said, why didn't you do anything? And the woman, she said, I'm the only one who went there from this community. Some research too. His was quantitative, but he looked at all of the reservations, or reserves as they call them in Canada, in British Columbia, and their suicide rates. And he wanted to look at how much in control is each community of their lives. So we looked at about five or six things like health, police, schools, cultural activities, women running the community. And he found that the more of these things the communities have, the lower the suicide rate. So between his research and our work, the government decided to create a new policy for Indigenous Suicide Prevention Canada. It was called the National Aboriginal Youth Suicide Prevention Strategy. You know what they did? They asked Native communities to apply for money to do their own suicide prevention programs. And they said, you guys create your own programs. You guys will run your own programs. And we will fund you. The colonizer has turned around. They're actually paying Native communities to put together their own programs and to run their own programs. And a couple of years ago, I spoke to one of the people I was in charge of this, and, she, and I asked her, how's it going? She said, it's actually going well. We've funded over 200 communities, and she thinks the suicides were going down. I said, how's the evaluation going? Because believe it or not, the government flew me to Ottawa to help them put together a, a, an evaluation of those programs. And it was a participatory evaluation put together where the communities would help evaluate their own programs. So I asked her, how's that going? She said, well, we never did it. Welcome to the government. They decided to put something together and then nothing happens. But she said she thought it was, she thought it was working, so who knows. But here's the government actually paying Native communities to do their own thing. So did the government ever take their own ideas and put them in law and say, you have to do this with your program? No. No, they left it up, the, up to the communities. The communities decided what they were going to do. So each community was doing something different. And, and they didn't enforce their own laws no. on them to get that money? No, there was no formula. There, there, no, there was no formula. See, that, that's another thing like over here. A lot of time they'll put restrictions. Yeah. And if you don't do this, yeah. you don't get the money. Yeah, like they need health service. Do yeah. your do the ten step program yeah. for, for you rehab. You have to do this to get this. You have to do the ten step program. You, you, you're not gonna do what I want to do. Exactly, yeah. So the so Indian health is hard. So here in the States they're kind of ignoring what the communities want to do. Right. Like traditional healing. Is that a government thing? No. No. So yeah. This is a picture I took in uh, May of a man with his kids on a dog team. Let me tell you about the return of the sun as I finish. The return of the sun is an old tradition that the Inuit had, because in the winter the sun disappears. November through January there's no sun. Maybe October, yeah, November through January. Anyways, in, in the middle of January, the sun comes up, but comes back. What happened before any white people were there was that when the sun first appeared on the horizon, the children would run into the igloo and tell their parents,
parents and grandparents, the sun is back. So they had this kulik, a, a bowl uh, with, with seal oil and, and wicks, which had fire. That's how they cooked their food, and warmed the igloo a little bit, created some light. They extinguished the flame and they relit it symbolically, saying, the sun has come back, things will be better, hunting will be better, we'll be happier, it'll be warmer. So the return of the sun was a special occasion. Today, Igloolik, every January, has a return of the sun festival. It's huge. People from all over the place come to Igloolik for that festival. At the beginning of the festival, they have an old woman, she died recently, and a young girl, and this kumik, the seal oil lamp. And that's how they begin the festival every year, with a girl and an old woman and the seal oil lamp, and they relight it. And that's the beginning of the festival. Then at the festival they have women doing throat singing, which is pretty amazing. They do their own kind of throat singing, which is actually really quite beautiful. Drum dancing, the missionaries never got rid of that. The shamans used to do that with a big drum. And then the politicians get up and they talk about what they are doing for their people to bring control back to the people. So it's a great festival and we've talked about the return of the sun being a theme for all of our research projects and we've done quite a few over the last 25 years. That the return of the sun is symbolic of control coming back to the Inuit. Now one sad story. They had to close the youth center. Apparently because it was too small and it was a fire hazard, there were too many kids in there. As you can see, it wasn't a very big house. The suicides have come back today. They're back. I've talked to my friends up there, even the people who are young people today, they're like 20 years older. Uh, is there a youth committee? No. Is there a youth center? No. Nobody's doing anything right now. So we need to wait for maybe another generation, I don't know, for young people to come together and to do something what those two other generation, younger generations of young people have done. So I'm optimistic that it will happen again in this one community. But other communities have also done different things and the suicides have come down. And each community has done, some, again, something different from the other. It's their own project. They own it. It's called collective efficacy. That's when a group of people are in control of their lives together. So that's my message for suicide prevention, especially in native communities here. Is let's try and get our young people together to put together their own projects, their own activities. Because when they do, look what happened. Suicides went down. You know what else happened in that community? when they opened the youth center, attendance in high school went way up. Only 75% 75, 75 of the kids do not finish high school. But school attendance actually went way up. Breaking into people's houses, which young people do, went way, way down. So there were other positive outcomes from this youth center. So again, my message is, Let's be participatory. Let's have the young people come in. Let's have them organize themselves. We can be facilitators, but it's their project. They run it. And when that happens, it works. And research has found that participatory health projects, even just looking at health, when you do that in communities, they usually work quite well. They work better than government programs, like you just said, that are just dropped on a community saying, here, do this. That's not us. But when they do it themselves, it actually works. So 
So that's my message to you. Kuyanemik, which means thank you. 